So first off, we're going to start with teams in the metabolic challenge. We have the hackaholics on deck. Are you guys ready? So, uh, Tadija, are you uh, on? Uh, yes, one second. Um, let me just select the, the screen. Okay, do you see the screen? Uh, we see the screen. Okay, great. Okay, so hello all. Uh, I'm here to speak for our team, Hecolcolics, and we had the metabolic disorders challenge. So let's continue. So basically what we wanted to do for our challenge was uh, make uh, some sort of bad content predictor. And the kind of data that uh, we had available on one hand was the parameters like age, sex of the patients, that is the subjects, uh, as well as the, some of the related diseases they may have had. And then for a subset, we had the RNA sequence profiles. And we tried in several different ways to see if we can in some way make a prediction of uh, the fat content depending on these variables. So uh, in the first place, we did some very simple vi vi visualizations to see like in which general directions we may proceed. And we found that, for instance, uh, uh, parameters like sex didn't seem to uh, change the average or median percentage of the liver. It's the same with uh, pancreas, I believe. Uh, obviously, one other factor like the number of diseases which we looked at seems to be a bit better at predicting, which makes sense. If the liver has four diseases, it's probably going to be a bit more fatty than the average disease and then we also made this graph of oops uh taking into account the hardy scale of deaths so how the patients die but uh, that i assume had too much noise and random uh random input for the sample size so it didn't it didn't give us uh, some very good picture of what's happening and why so some of the first methods we tried were, that is one of the methods we tried was making an artificial neural network. And uh, we were using uh, the diseases as we were trying to predict the fat content from the diseases. And then we also built another uh, neural network which uh, took uh, not only the diseases and uh, it also took uh, age, sex, as well as the number of diseases that the person had. It turns out that the number of diseases uh, in the end ended up contributing a bit more noise, which makes sense. It's uh, You have to have a very large data set to probably make uh, sense of something, something like that. But uh, depending on the liver or pancreas, I think this was... Um, the liver here, I'm not sure. It uh, ended up getting okay results clustering. One minute around. remaining. Right. Okay, so we also uh, did the uh, RNA, uh, considered the RNA sequence and did some analysis. And uh, basically what we looked at was we separated everything into two groups, the high fat and low fat, and figured out if some genes were overexpressed or underexpressed. Some of these can be seen on the plots, but I don't have very much time. And what we ended doing in the end was using the, the amount of, the normalized amount of expressed genes to try and train some neural network. And well, we found that it had okay performance. It, uh, it uh, didn't, uh, perhaps we would have needed more data to make a good predictor because right now our neural network uh, 
usually only predicts well for the low amount of fat percentages. 10 uh, seconds. Uh, well, that would be it. My team, uh, we were um, doing the presentation at the last second, so we didn't make the conclusion slide, but uh, I guess you can uh, conclude from what I've spoken to now because we don't have much time. All right, we go over to the mentors for questions. Uh, mentors of the Metabolic yeah. Challenge. And uh, if there's... Can I just make a very stupid quick yeah. question? Uh, just... Sorry, Ivan. Um, the questions are limited to mentors of that challenge at this stage. Okay, sorry. Hi, uh, Alex. It's, it looks like you have something to, uh, to bring up. Yeah, I think Vanessa also wanted to, to say something. I don't know. Do you want to go ahead? Um, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just... Uh, I mean, how would you conclude? You know, you, you said you didn't have time for the conclusion, but um, right, uh, right. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> At a high level, how would how would you conclude? Where 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 would you suggest going from here? Uh, I think that uh, a good direction to go from here would be. I think uh, our models would really. By the way, there's some feedback, so maybe if you could. Uh, I don't know. Someone's mic seems to be turned down. Um. Okay, so the way in which I think we should proceed was if we had larger data sets, maybe the, the RNA sequence data could be used. Uh, we could find some genes which had more importance. Right now we couldn't have found very many genes. And then maybe that would improve the neural network model and we would find some better connections between gene expression and the amount of fat content. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right, and we have to move on to the next presentation. Thank you. Okay, you guys. Next up, we have Bioluminati, and after that, it'll be uh, Liragatsa de Porta Venezia. Um, just prepare yourselves, guys. Um, Bioluminati, do we have uh, one of you? Yep. Great. Please start. Uh, by Illuminati, uh, I can't hear you guys. You guys are ready to start. Uh, hello, can hello, you guys Deepak? hear? Yeah, hi, I'm audible right now. Uh, yes, you're audible uh, and we're ready to go. All right, all right. Okay, so yeah, hi, uh, I'm, my name is Deepak and I'm presenting on behalf of Team BioLumnati. So a little bit about us, we are a group of five undergraduates from IIT Kanpur majoring in BSB and I just want to say that this is the first time that we have taken part in something like this and being able to apply machine learning to a real world problem. And this has been a, a learning experience for us. And I want to thank everybody for being so helpful. So, okay. So as far as the work that we have done is concerned, uh, the first thing that we did was we took the data set, which did not have the RNA sequence information and try to decompose it in the sense that uh, for example, we had the RD scale. So what we did was we divided it into five categories and assigned it a zero one value uh, based on whether, based on which category it, 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 it falls into. And then what we did was we did the same with the pathology that was associated. For example, uh, in case of the livers, whether they, the individual had fibrosis cysts or not, we uh, divided these categories and then assigned a one zero value. And then the next thing we did was we tried to visualize this data using correlation graphs and matrices. So what we did was the various parameters that we had created, we tried to see that what correlation does uh, liver fat has with these parameters and uh, similarly what the fat percentage in pancreas has, uh, whether it has a correlation with these factors. So here's where we are. Uh, when it comes to correlation with the uh, 
uh, fat content in pancreas, we saw that uh, uh, there were some correlations with the age bracket that was there and then the way that the individual has died only intermediate, but we don't think this was really important. The important part that we could get from here is the pathology in pancreas. So here what we see is that uh, if an individual dies from atrophy, fibrosis or pancreatitis, there is some relation between the fat content which is present in pancreas and the pathology that has happened. It also shows that fat liver, the liver present, the uh, fat which is present in liver has some correlation with the fat in the pancreas. Moving on, uh, this one's pretty interesting too. We found that uh, in case of liver, the pathologies which were associated with pancreas had little effect on liver, which was of course expected. And But the pathologies of the uh, liver, like cirrhosis, fibrosis, and steatotis, these diseases did have some correlation with the uh, liver fat content. So next, based on these, we tried to implement a linear regression model in scikit. We, what we did was we did the usual thing, we divided the data set into training data and uh, testing data set to, uh, and we try to fit it into a linear regression model uh, and we use these parameters to evaluate the model, model performance. Unfortunately, this was the first time we had used this data. One minute implement, remaining. Yeah, implement uh, our model. So the results were not really uh, as good as we expected. As you can see, the scores were that we got were pretty low with this model. So the next thing that we did was we tried to uh, clean the RNA-seq data. So in the RNA-seq data, you had the data of liver, the genes expressed in liver as well as pancreas. What we did was we first divided into two separate subsets for the liver and pancreas. And then we, what, uh, using the previous data set we had, we tried to add values like gender, Hardy scale and pathology into this particular file. The uh, next step that we did was we tried to, some of the data that was present in the RNA-seq file had NAN values in them in the sense that for that, but those particular individuals, there were no RNA information available. So we even eliminated those values, which were giving us a NAN result. So that is what we Ten did. And the next step we wanted to uh, divide the subjects into two data sets to find the differentially expressed genes, but we weren't unable to do so. And that is all we have done. If we had time, we would probably, first of all, find the differentially expressed genes and then try to implement the model. All right, That's and we go over to the mentors for questions. Yes, thank you. This is a really nice presentation. Um, one question. So the first results that you were showing, those tables, um, were they done on the whole data set or did you? Yeah, yeah, those, yeah. Um, so, look further. Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah. did you redo it on the sequencing data and did it look the same? Yeah, yeah. I didn't get a chance to elaborate on that. What we did was, yeah. uh, this was sort of a sub super set. In the sense that this had uh, much larger values. So what we did was with the RNA seq, we tried to match the gene IDs and then we concatenated this matrix to the previous one. So what we've done is we've taken these two data sets and made them into one. So as far as your question is concerned, yes, we did the same thing for the uh, for the uh, RNA seq data too. I mean, here it's not visible, but we have done the same thing. It's sort of a bigger matrix in terms of columns, but the rows are less because the subjects are lesser values. So yes, we've done okay. the same. Thing. Great. And if you were to continue on this, what would be your next steps? Yeah. Next step, what especially for the RNA-C data is we want to find a criteria in which the two data sets can be separated into two different clusters to find the differentially expressed genes. Because here, I, that was a question that I asked because I, we are not able to find out how we can... Guys, we need to keep the time. I'm sorry. Um, we need to move on to the next team. Mentors and teams I, I, are welcome to uh, speak privately afterwards and, and to continue this discussion. Um, yeah, well, next up, we you. have uh, Loragata de la Porta. Hello, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Okay, then I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, here we go. Uh, this is our presentation. As a starting note, I would say uh, we come from a master degree that is very, very focused on proteins. And one of the reasons we chose this challenge was to try something more genomic oriented, gene expression oriented. And so we, our approach was basically kind of trying to juggernaut ourselves with brute force through all the methods we could think of. Um, and what we wanted to do was basically first off trying to find out some correlation between the metadata and possible 
possibly between them and some and gene expression values. And then also maybe trying to build some predictor of fat levels, uh, starting either from the metadata or from that and gene expression levels. Uh, so what we did was a lot of uh, scatter plots. Uh, then one thing we did and we didn't report the results for was uh, a differential expression analysis. Uh, but then here we go. So here we did basically every single plot we could think of. We uh, made, uh, tried to correlate the percentage in liver and pancreas um, and to, to plot the general distributions to see uh, what was more or less going on. Uh, then we tried to correlate the percentages of fat in the two tissues by age bracket or not correlate, I mean to just plot, to just see what they looked like. Uh, and what is very evident from here is that like the distribution of these data is very very sparse uh, and one thing that makes it really evident here is for example what I tried to do was at some point to uh, box plot the percentages of fat in the two tissues divided by sex and then do the same after filtering out only the data that didn't have any annotation about the disease which was supposed to be healthy but if you see the box plots of pancreas you can see that the distributions are very, very sparse and they do not look like they're supposed to. So this makes us things, uh, think that um, there could be some cleaning to be done additionally. Then we try to do some PCA uh, with the rough data. Um, so this, for example, uh, we did on the pancreas RNA-seq. Um, and sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the Zoom little window. Okay, also these lights are swapped for some reason. Okay. Um, and what you, what you can see here is that basically in this first very rough analysis that we did, there are these two big clusters uh, clustering by sex. So this is probably an indicator that we, um, okay, there was something wrong going on in there. Um, then uh, we also tried to do uh, the same thing first uh, also like on, on the on the liver rna seq data first um using all the data set uh that had rna seq data and then by subsetting only uh two small subsets one with low levels one minute of remaining fat and one with um with high levels of fat in the liver and so these were, this was for the PCA analysis. We couldn't see much signal, unfortunately. Going on, we tried to do some machine learning, uh, both regression and classification. Uh, and we used, for the most part, neural networks. And uh, here we tried to combine uh, both the metadata encoded uh, in numerical form uh, in a similar way as the previous team did. And then also using the um, RNA expression data of the subsets of genes that we found as differentially expressed. And here you can see some of the things uh, that were going on in the training phases and validation phases. And on the top right, you can see the mean absolute error for regression on fat pancreas percentage. And this is the one where we maybe see a little bit more signal. Um, and so this is more or less what we did. Ten seconds. Our conclusions is, uh, are that probably since the signal we see is so confounded everywhere, uh, the main point was uh, to try to clean the data better in order to understand them better afterwards. Uh, um, okay. And it alone didn't need that. All right, we go over to the mentors for questions. Yeah, very, very nice job. And I think it's, it's great to see that you, um, that you also put your code out there. Um, when, when you looked at the RNA sequencing data, did you do any normalization across uh, the samples? I mean, I, specifically for the first PCA plot you showed, there was uh, on, on one of the principal components show pretty clearly the difference between uh, between the, the tissues, I think, but the, the first component was was something that, that wasn't super clear to me. Do you have any idea what was shown there on the first different and uh, two different components?
Um, First PCA plot you showed, I'm, I'm talking yeah. about it. Yeah. No, you can I share it again? Uh, guys, you have like 30 seconds to answer this, otherwise we <laughs> yeah. just move on. I, I am I'm part of the group, uh, like... Uh, uh, six, okay, I see, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the, the, this type of analysis because uh, I, I got to start uh, of working with uh, differential expression analysis just last month. Mm. But uh, yeah, the plot is uh, represented the... Um, it plot the the, the um, different expressed genes uh, of uh, all the samples together. So and then I, I just painted the the color of the the dots uh, according yeah. to the sex. And I guess I mean my main question was you know it's sort of there's a clear line trend, right? Um, you know wh whether you have any sort of ideas what that could be or you know what mm -hmm. what could be behind that. No, I have no idea. I mean, as far as we can see from the plot, it's just uh, okay, text guys. And, I'm uh, sorry, you're gonna have to take this uh, after the session. Oh, okay. Um, and we're gonna move on to the next team. Um, quarantine statistics is up after that. Um, can you? Are you guys here? And um, please prepare yourselves. Otherwise, we'll have to um, swap in another team for that presentation slot. Uh, quarantine statistics are ready. They just messaged me. Okay. Um, so, but up next, it's Scottish superpowers, right? Or is that just the team that presented? My no, Scottish superpowers next. They're next. All right. Are you guys here? Scottish superpowers, yes. Great. So uh, to present in. Uh, yep. Please share your screen. Yeah. Ready to go. So. So hi everyone. We're kind of superpowers, and for the metabolic disorders challenge, we're giving a data set of fat content in the liver and pancreatic tissue along with metadata of the of, uh, patients. Um, and the questions that we set were, what drives fat content in pancreas and liver? And if we can uh, identify predictors that we can use to uh, make an estimator of fat content in these tissues. We approached this problem from three directions. First was to do exploratory data analysis uh, on the data sets. Secondly was to do differential expression analysis on the rna -seq data that accompanied the main data set. And third was to try and build the machine learning model. So, uh, firstly, in the exploratory data analysis, uh, we tried to see if there's any correlation of fat percentage between, pan between pancreas and liver, but we observed very low correlation for reasons unknown. We don't know if it's a technical or biological reason for and for very low correlation. However, uh, we saw a significant difference between the different age groups, in particular age group of 60 to 69 years old with the other age groups, not all of them, where a significant difference. And our hypothesis is that in this age bracket, uh, there are other, um, uh, other illnesses coming up that could affect the fat content in these tissues. Next, we did the prism carbon analysis in the RNA seq data, and we see that uh, on the hardest scale, uh, samples of that fast death uh, cluster separately, and this coincides with uh, the RNA uh, quality of these samples. So this strongly suggests that there is a technical bias in these samples. Next, uh, on the differential expression analysis, we separated uh, two groups, one group with uh, low content, low fat content, and one with high fat content. And here we can see in the volcano plots the differentially expressed genes and their p-values. And subsequently, we ex extracted 
the differentially ex expressed transcripts that had low correlation between them. And then we use them to add them to the patient metadata and train our model with this with them. And we saw a quite significant improvement in the model after one minute remaining. After including this metadata, uh, uh, after including sorry uh, the transcripts, it looks that they have a significant effect. So we were happy with uh, so far with this result in the machine learning model. The future steps that we would take if we had more time to work on this, it would be that we would further look into the technical and biological confounders uh, to improve the, the results. Um, and we would investigate the biology from the transcripts and also using the transcripts uh, to do pathway enrichment analysis. And we would take only the subset of biologically relevant uh, transcripts to see if that improves the machine learning model. 10 seconds. Thank you, I'm finished. Thanks, and we go over to the mentors for question. Wonderful, this was a um, really nice presentation. Thanks a lot, guys, and great work. I really liked uh, your plot where you're looking into the quality of the sequencing data and associating that to the Hardy scale. I think that's um, really important uh, to keep in mind when working with this data set. Um, so, as for questions, um, what um, have you excluded any samples when you're looking at the whole data set? Um, I don't think at this stage we, uh, I mean, for the expression analysis, uh, mm -hmm. we, we used, we use this as, conf uh, uh, so we use this as as uh, covariates in their uh, differential expression analysis, the hard scale and the and mm -hmm. their inequality. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I don't think we excluded any any samples, any patient samples altogether. That would be one of the next things when we would look uh, more into detail the quality uh, if we had more time. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Uh, we have to move on to the next team now, uh, Quarantine Statistics, and after them, HackMe will be next. Quarantine Statistics, are you guys here? Yeah, we're here. Great, uh, please go ahead. Okay, one second. Okay, you guys see it? We see it. Um, so I'm Nina and I'll be presenting on behalf of Quarantine Statistics. So the aim of this project was to understand the relationship between gene expression and fat accumulation in the pancreas and the liver. We frame the problem as a supervised learning task. Given X containing age, sex, heart death scale, and normalized gene counts, we predicted Y, which was the liver and pancreas fat percentages. This is a standard regression problem and it can be solved by minimizing the mean squared error between the model predictions from X and resulting Y. To train and evaluate the models, we split the data set into train valid test partitions. The train set was 85%, validation set 10%, and test set 5%. With a total of 93 patients with gene samples, these validation and test partitions are at risk of not including all feature types, so we use stratified sampling to distribute minority classes correctly. For the gene counts, we also took out several duplicates and standardized all the features. These are our results. These predictions are based off the metadata or age, sex, and Hardy scale, as well as gene expression data. Um, as you can see, the lower um, MSE, which stands for mean squared error, is better, and the bolded one is the models where we found the best predictions. Um, so as you can see for the test set, the best model was KNN, which, or K nearest neighbors. We also looked into gene importance analysis using a random forest feature importance. Um, the important features mean that the features that are more closely related with 
um, fat uh, percentage in the liver and pancreas, and they contribute more to variation in this. And it's important to note that the one on the left shows the top 10 genes that are most closely related to liver fat percentage, and the one on the right shows the top 10 genes most closely related to pancreas fat percentage. That's just a little typo. Um, and it's uh, interesting to note that we could actually predict um, these genes not without knowing the fat percentage of the other one. So we don't need to know the liver fat percentage to predict pancreas fat and vice versa. So the winner was the K nearest neighbor. That was the one where we got the best results with it. The X axis shows the most important gene from the slide before for pancreas. And the Y axis is the fat percentage of this um, uh, for the pancreas. Um, it uses One every remaining. Okay, it uses every sample from the validation and the test. The prediction is orange and the ground truth is the blue line. So as you can see, um, the prediction plot correlates with scale. So it's good at predicting high and low fat percentages, but the scales aren't in proportion. So it appears that it is a very good predictor of if the fat percentage is high or low, but the predictions don't correlate uh, with exact percentages as well. So therefore a classification loss would be more accurate to look at. Our conclusions are, um, or conclusions are recap in future research. So to recap, we built an experiment to predict fat, fat tissue from gene counts and subject metadata. We found that Ten seconds. We found that K-nearest neighbor showed the best prediction accuracy, particularly in high and low fat classification. We also looked in feature important analysis that suggests that these two gene IDs um, are the best for uh, predicting fat tissue. For further research, we would like to look at genes that, the genes that we found that are most important for fat prediction to further understand this analysis. Thank you guys. And now we go over to the mentors for a question. Yes. Thank you so much for a very nice and uh, clear presentation. Uh, what we have so far thought for your um, presentation was, have you looked into what these genes are and what they actually do, these gene IDs that you have provided? Uh, what is the biology behind them? And do you know the... Um, no, so that's what we said we wanted to do for further research, is to look more into those. Yeah, you haven't looked them up in the uh, We, we have looked them up. Genome? Sorry? Yeah, I have. We have looked. Um, we have looked them up, but we haven't had enough time to fully analyze all of them and understand them. Thank I think you. That's what I have so far, at least. Okay. Um, all right, and now we're going to move to Hack Me, and after that, it's going to be the Pinguestigators. Um, Hack Me, are you guys here? Hello. Hey, uh, we can hear you. Uh, how, how can you hear me? So. I, I can hear you fine. Uh, can you please go ahead and share your screen? Okay. Um. All right, you're all ready to go. Okay. So, I will tell you about uh, this project, fat content in liver and pancreas tissue, and uh, we we had two different tasks. Uh, one is uh, some data representation. We have two data sets: one with sequencing, one with an, uh, with no sequencing. So uh, let's have a look. Um, we have a nice uh, box plots. Uh, you can see here um, <clears throat> division by female, male, and age groups and uh, axis, axis are uh, fat levels in uh, liver and pancreas. So, and um, <clears throat> orange dots are sequenced data. And as you can see, female with, uh, in 60s uh, have no sequencing with high uh, liver uh, fat level. Uh, and uh, the same about male, very high age, no sequencing at all. So let's have a look further. Uh, something about uh, <clears throat> correlations, uh, something about, some insight about uh, <clears throat> uh, 
um, diseases. Uh, so, for example, you can see for cirrhosis, uh, some data sequencing, RNA sequencing may be done to add um, data for cirrhosis. Uh, same you can say about liver congestion, same groups. Um, <clears throat> and liver fibrosis again, um, high age group with fibrosis not sequenced and um, can have a look now at steatosis, uh, pancreas fibrosis, pancreas saponification, So, and uh, here is a list of all groups which you may uh, look to sequence. Uh, and actually, small data set with sequences is uh, um, just 100 rows and it's uh, low to, uh, it, is, it is very little to understand uh, correlations with RNA-seq. Um, but we we tried uh, to do that also. So in RNA seq data. So uh, we uh, took gene TPMs. Um, first, we select only uh, protein and collagen genes. Uh, filter. Um, we categorize all seq data by sample, sex and tissue. So we obtained four data sets and analyzed them. <coughs> um, analyze them. So uh, here you can see distribution of average gene expression and uh, distribution of STD to mean gene expression. And um, we filtered low STD to mean, uh, they give no uh, variance to data and also a low mean levels uh, because uh, genes which are not expressed uh, okay then we did uh, some clustering to maybe find some gene markers and uh, 23 centroid of clusters they are uh, they represent they have 23 genes that which could be markers uh, to look at uh, they correlate with fat level and also uh, we can see that um, all right, I'm um, sorry, you're going to have to go to conclusion now and mentor question. So uh, this part about clustering is uh, like for future plans to look at these genes more carefully. And uh, I guess that's all. Thanks. And we go to the mentors for a question. Yes, thank you very much. This was a nice presentation and nice work. I really liked how you were looking into um, differences between the sequenced cohort and the non-sequenced cohort. Um, and then also doing all of these um, scatter plots, uh, looking at different subsets. Could you just uh, summarize what were your most important learnings? Like where do the sequenced and the non-sequenced samples disagree the most? And where do you find the most correlation between pancreas and liver fat? Um. We think that uh, fat levels in um, liver and pancreas are um, not correlated, but there are very little data with high uh, liver fat level and also pancreas fat level. Um, and so we, in cohort groups, uh, ages and uh, male, female, there are also mm, no clear correlation in a given data set, but there are there is correlation between gene groups uh, so maybe um, we found uh, genes in different data sets male and female uh, in from x or y chromosomes for example uh, in all right guys uh, we're gonna have to make that a wrap please take it offline after the session uh, now we have the next team the ping investigators uh, and after them we're gonna have that team um, ping investigators are you guys ready we are ready. Uh, in order for me to share my screen, um, this group, yes, perfect. Right, I'm, I'm getting go. that set up right now. I'm sharing. 
and I think we are good to go. All right, go. All right. Hello, everyone. We are the Pingastigators, an international team of master students, specialists, and hackers. We chose the metabolic disorders cha uh, and changes in tissues challenge for this event. The most exciting outcome of our project was the potential launching point for improving the predictive power of future machine learning models. And today, I'd like to show you how we got there. The figures you see in the slides are made specifically from liver tissue data in the public GTX database, but we use a standardized workflow to manipulate the additional pancreas data that is in exactly the same way. Each data set has some 18 unique pathology categories and an additional eight interesting features to choose from. So in order to manage this highly dimensional data, we began by applying a combination of hierarchical clustering and the TSNI algorithm. The results of the hierarchical clustering can be seen here on the left. And one thing to note is the three major groups that appear. We encode these groups graphically by coloring the 2D representation of the data according to which group each point belongs to. From here, the goal is to find a good selection of features that can be used to explain the grouping. The results of our first three attempts uh, at this selection are shown here. Our first three selections were the age of the patient, the Hardy scale measure, and the tissue fat content percentage. By visually inspecting each of these plots, it immediately shows that these selections do not match the groupings from before. The next selection at the bottom here comes from binning the frequencies of fat percentage in the data and splitting such that there is a reasonable number of counts in each split. Although this selection did not explain the groupings that emerge from clustering techniques, it does lead us to a new pathway. Specifically, we source the connection between pathways and different genes from the uh, KEG database. And this new data is useful as a proxy for gene expression. As such, we can match to the genes present in the original GT GTX dataset. Then we apply the same splitting from the previous step. Doing so allows us to probe for st statistically significant differences in the RNA sequence. This process was a success as seen by the figures here on either side. And in particular, we were able to identify 806 differentially expressed genes. We can see that steroid bio biosynthesis and terpenoid backbone biosynthesis were the most enriched biological pathways associated with the liver tissues. We can see a similar figure for the pancreas tissue on the right that is the result of the same analysis. Cholesterol metabolism is the most enriched pathway for pancreas tissue. And the main takeaway from this uh, but is that by augmenting the original data set with RNA-seq data, we are now in a position to create better predictive models. To this seconds. end, we plan on continuing work by testing the capabilities of matching up regulated pathways to patient profiles through the RNA-seq data. And finally, we would like to repeat our selection with a little bit more narrow focus. Thank you for listening. And the link to this repo is available on the presentation slides, along with some supplemental material. Thank you, guys. We now go over to the mentors for a question. I think, uh, I mean, great presentation and, and great that you put in a lot of content. Um, maybe I missed that, but, but your initial clustering or where you came up with the three groups, what, 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 what again was that based on? Yeah, that one, that one. This clustering that we see on the right hand mm -hmm. side uh, is the result of bringing down high dimensional data using the TSNI algorithm. Those groupings that you see, group one, group two, group three with the different colors, mm -hmm. they come from encoding which point belongs to which group as a result of using a hierarchical clustering algorithm. So, so you did the clustering on top of the, uh, the TSNI projection? That would be correct, yes. And, and then again, what was the, the original input matrix? Wh which features were those that went into the TSNI? Um, I believe those features would be certain, uh, obviously just certain features from the GTX data. One of my teammates mm -hmm. might be able to better answer yeah. that question if you'd like to give us a okay. Slack message. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I can answer on your question. Uh, the original matrix was the gene expression um, data from the GTX. Okay. Thank cool. you so much for your questions. Great work. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And we now move over to the next team. That would be uh, that team. Are you guys here? Uh, yeah, we are here. Great. 
After that team, we're going to have the full senders. Uh, that team, uh, feel free to start. Very well. Uh, I think I can just share a screen. And there it is. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm Simon, and I'll be uh, speaking on behalf of that team, a rag team of last minute uh, attendees united for this uh, fascinating event. And uh, I'm going to present uh, what uh, we did during this hackathon and what our plans are, well, uh, future plans. So, uh, as everyone, we started with a little bit of EDA, and then we decided to took differential uh, uh, expression an uh, analysis pathway to see if we can see some uh, meaningful insights in the data and uh, use it to uh, build better predictors to the, uh, predict fact content uh, that, that we were given. So, uh, uh, basically, the analysis uh, was to split uh, into uh, our data into three groups based on uh, age, and we did some pipeline uh, for that uh, separately on liver and pancreas. And from here uh, came inside that uh, liver was probably a better. Well, we, we decided to focus on the uh, liver samples because uh, they were a little bit uh, easier. And uh, of course, there were some creation of contrast matrix and fitting contrast matrices, but uh, these were not so uh, decent size were not so useful. Uh, so, and of course, from the analysis or the samples, we uh, found out uh, upregulated genes, and this uh, proved to be pretty useful since uh, having such a small data set, uh, curse of dimensionality is uh, really up in. Well, uh, a real, real problem. So, uh, finding upregulated genes, we could uh, get that smaller data set, smaller feature uh, set to use for machine learning. And uh, as everyone, we thought of uh, using uh, machine learning and uh, actually even deep learning methods. But uh, we uh, f foresaw that this with this small data set, it may be a problem. So we uh, seek out uh, some alternative approaches and what we thought uh, we could we could use is a few shot learning uh, for this method we actually had to uh, compromise and uh, get to a classification problem because basically what this method does it compares seen sample with uh, other other sample that is uh, somewhat similar and a model just tries to predict is it the same or different and uh, that's how the predictions uh, could, could be done. And uh, what we did, we did uh, this out of the box model, of course, uh, compared the two baselines and uh, the, the probably what I want to, uh, uh, well, to point out here is that we chose to use a really interesting test split. Uh, well, uh, training test, uh, testing split is that, uh, most of the data went to testing and uh, we really used only a few, uh, few samples for training. Though results are not stellar, uh, we are, are still confident in this method and think uh, that few shot learning can be, uh, can have a future for uh, real life problems like these where uh, we have really small data sets with uh, big uh, feature space uh, where overfitting is a problem and where, well, basically, uh, where outliers are a problem. So we think that that could uh, be really useful. It just should not be done out of the box as it was uh, uh, during this week. So All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. And now we go over to the mentors for a question. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I only have a very high level question, <laughs> but you, you can go ahead if you want. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, nice work. So you have worked exclusively on the sequencing data set. Did I get that right? 
Uh, yes, we worked. Uh, actually, we did some EDA on uh, well this metadata, but uh, we decided not to mix this feature since it just uh, it's an additional work with no guaranteed results. So yes, we worked exclusively on sequence data. Okay, and have you looked into any uh, methods for excluding outliers or um, looking into noise um, reduction or? Something around that? Uh, actually, uh, no, since uh, these uh, Siamese networks, they are called Siamese networks, uh, were applied out of the box. Uh, we just found a number of uh, genes uh, that could be, uh, that was uh, enough to do the convolution, since it's a deep learning convolutional network, uh, and uh, the data should. Uh, have enough dimensions uh, in, in this case. So we just found the number of genes and applied the method, but probably in the future, yes, uh, some data set cleaning should be a priority. All right, and we're over time with that. Uh, thank you guys, and now we move on to the next team. Uh, please, uh, there we go. Uh, full senders, I believe. Are you guys here? Yeah. Yes, we are. Hello. Great. And after I quickly that, gonna have... Oh, sorry. Teddy? Sorry. Could I quickly ask if someone from the Dream team is ready to present after the full senders? I haven't been able to get through. We are here. Great. All right, great. Uh, full senders, you're ready to go. Starting now. All right, so we are team full senders with the fake paper detector challenge and our goal was to determine similarities of ratios of parts of speech and paper mill data and create a way to identify if the paper was from the paper mill. We decided to stick to the same mill instead of machine learning for cluster data. So we used We use the metadata from the provided papers as our data set, and after rejecting a number of options, we decided to focus on the writing uh, style of the abstract, and LTK was used to tag parts of speech within the abstract for each paper mill data point. Uh, then we decided to graph the values that we felt would be characteristic of an individual's writing style. Uh, then we processed the adjectives per noun ratio after examining the uh, graphs and we found that the mean ratio for, and then we found the mean ratio for adjectives to noun and paper mill papers. After that, we formed a cluster with low standard deviation and found the variance between individual paper mill data points and the mean with higher variance equaling less likely to belong to this paper mill. So for our results, um, here you can see a depiction of the POS variables and a comparison between fake and red and then Green, uh, real and green papers. And we saw really high separation on quite a few of these variables. And as you can see, this y-axis is adjectives per noun, so we decided to delve into that a bit further. And after using that, we discovered three um, outliers of the false data that need to be further investigated. So sources of error arise from the slice function to measure length of sentences. Um, decimal points represented the end of a sentence. We, um, however, there were no noticeable changes due to outliers because we didn't process this data. Um, NLTK may have um, identified the wrong POS. In the future, we'd like to experiment with other systems. Uh, furthermore, the manually sorted variance values may not accurately depict the adjectives to noun ratio. So some sort of way to uh, change that would be ideal. So if we develop this project further, we would hope to make better use of clustering to more accurately identify styles of writing with scikit-learn. And as an aside, we would love to be able to delve into machine learning in general. We would also like to get input of those in the English field to determine more import important POS ratios for estimating writing style, and perhaps even use weighted standard deviations for multiple ratios to, to like make a collaboration of um, an author's writing style. We then like to make, create a ranking system where questionable papers could be submitted and compared to fake data sets. And with that, we thank you very much for facilitating and providing this learning experience. It has been a wild ride. Thank you, and we now go over to a mentor question. So yeah, thanks a lot. 
good job and good presentation. So why do you think you, what do you think is the main reason why you see a difference in writing style between these fake papers and the randomly selected papers that we provided? That's definitely because the paper mill, because they have to create such a high volume of papers, uh, you have, you're going to have one person or a group of individuals writing um, with a similar format. So you're going to see these clusters of uh, like words per sentence and adjectives per noun comparisons where the, the styles meet up. So you see the ones from the paper mill have a more narrow distribution because it's the same people. Yes. Could also well be that you see some differences simply because we know already that we see differences between how different nationalities write. So yes. It could also simply be that this is how Chinese papers look, not because they're fake. Mm -hmm. It could also play into the distribution of words per sentence. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Next up, we have the dream team. And after that, we have the fake it till you make it. Uh, dream team, are you here? Yes, we are here. Great. Uh, please feel free to share your screen and get started. Oh, wait. We also did the fake paper detector. And other people have looked at this before and they saw different things that stood out. But one of them was that the titles of the fake papers were very similar in terms of structure. So what we thought we would look at was, though the words are probably not conserved, then we would think that the word classes would be conserved. Uh, so the word classes in order of the order that is presented in, and also in the frequency of the word classes. So we thought that if we can take the titles and we can translate the words and the titles into word classes, maybe we could use this to identify the fake papers. And the first thing we did was to say, how do we represent these titles? And we use a TFIDF to get a vector representation of the titles where each title is the row here and each column is the words that exist across all the titles and then you simply do a count uh, of each of the words for each of the titles and that's how we represented the titles and yes. oh, yeah yeah i'm taking over so we look more into the word classes so we set up like a the the best model or the model from uh, from the paper we were handed that said that it would um most likely be first like a noun, then a verb, then a noun, noun. So we set up like a model and then we compared all of the title um, word classes to this model and tried to see like how accurate they were matching. So this is what you see up in this corner or uh, in the corner where you see the orange bars to be the controls and the blue ones to be the cases. They have somewhat of an overlap um, so we don't really think this might be the best way to go to identify um, the, yeah, to identify the fake papers. So instead we uh, took a step back. Yes, exactly. We took a step back and then we just tried to, uh, to yeah, vectorize the words in the titles instead and then make a logistic regression over these um, word frequencies and this actually gave us a pretty good accuracy around um, zero, yeah 95 percent um, we think this still needs a lot of work and there might be some uh, some fa not fa failures but there might be some holes somewhere that we uh, we missed out but it's a good start at least all right yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, we now go over to the mentor for questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, so first up, I would say this pattern of which words come in which order in the title, the separation you get from something that generic is actually better than I would have expected. Um, coming to the logistic regression, 
what did you test on? Did you test on the same data you were fitting on? So is it just how well no. the model managed to fit the data or did you have separate training and testing? No, we separated it in a, in a training and a test set. And I think we so used like a thousand training examples and then 400 and something test examples. Okay. And we also tried to like, we did it individually in the group just to test if, <laughs> if this was a one time a mistake. Yeah. But we all got something around the 95%. Yeah, it's pretty impressive, uh, to be honest. It, I feel the same. <laughs> like we were talking about maybe there are some internal properties that are different between the fake papers and the control papers. Maybe in all the fake papers there is, you know, a space in the beginning or something, but we haven't been able to identify it at least. Because I think it's like more that a lot wrong. of the fake papers on a very narrow selection of topics. They've done a lot of things with microRNAs and things like that because they're faking exactly the same kinds of experiments. I yeah. think the next step would definitely be to have a control set that only have like Chinese uh, papers from this year. Like make the control set more specific because this might show be also the same journals. Yeah, yeah exactly. The so same papers from the same nationality of authors from the same journals where the fake papers appeared. Yeah, so this might help. Yeah. All yeah. right. Thank you, guys. Uh, next up, we have the Fake It Till We Make It team. And after that, we're going to have Bio Craw Craw. Fake It Till We Make It. Are you guys? Uh, yeah, I'm just waiting here? for. OK. There waiting we go. Awesome. Cool. Let's get desktop. Sure. All right, everybody. So we are fake it till we make it. And we were working on the fake article detector. So a little bit more background about scientific fraud for you guys. So every year there are 2 million articles published within the sciences broadly. Little known fact though, is that about 2% of authors within the life sciences alone admit to faking their data or fabricating it in some way. So that means 2% of us are honest liars where we will do something horribly unethical and then admit to it shortly afterwards in an anonymous survey. Um, on top of that, in the past couple months, so like everybody's been talking about, there have been 400-ish articles found all related to a paper mill in China. And really right now, the only thing standing in the way of stopping fraud in these fake papers is peer review, clinical monitor trialing. If you happen to be in a country that does that, or dedicated tweeters like Elizabeth Bick that are really just out there rooting for us. But let's talk about paper mills a little bit more. So let's say I want a paper, but I don't have money or I don't have the patience or the time, or I just don't want to write this paper, but I want a paper. Well, guess what? You can buy one. So with that in mind, so with all these fake papers floating around from mills and also 2 million papers being published every year, we have this issue of can we systematically screen thousands or even millions of articles somehow? And what we're going to show you now is that yes, you can systematically scan them and accurately. So we did a machine learning approach with supervised training. So we worked with term frequency, inverse document frequency, or TF-IDF. And the way that works is if a term appears in multiple different papers, we're going to say that like, okay, that's good. It's gonna receive more weight. But then if the same term appears in this one document multiple times, we're gonna downweight that. So unimportant words like the word the, they'll appear multiple times in one document. So therefore, weight it less, it's not really that useful. So that's what we're using. And then we created our training test sets, used cross-fold validation, and these are our training results. Okay. So we used four different models from scikit-learn, used five-fold cross-validation. We did some hyper-parameter optimization. And then we did, we used our test set that was held out just once. So as you can see, we got pretty close to 99% accuracy on our holdout test set. And that was testing on it just once. So we weren't, at least we're pretty sure we weren't overfitting. So just with that alone, we'd be pretty happy with our results. But we sat down, we thought, we were like, okay, well, if we have these classifiers that are trained with good data and are performing well, like, what next? What do we do next? So we figured, hey, let's go to the wild. Let's actually try it. So 
we went ahead and we gathered another 8,000 abstracts. And these are all abstracts from Chinese authors. And I say Chinese in quotes because we're kind of stereotyping off of names, but these come from about a thousand different journals. So what we said is if three of our four optimized One models, minute. yeah, so if three of the four optimized models agreed that it was faked, we'd say that it was an actually a faked abstract. And with this method, we identified 14 new potentially faked abstracts. So we went ahead and we then started diving into what these new fake papers look like. And we found some figures that are actually completely duplicated among the new fake ones we found and the previously provided fakes. So here you have one example where you can see these gels are identical, but they're from two different papers. And we have another example here. Yeah, here of the same thing, or identical gels from two different papers. Um, so yeah, we still have more papers to delve through and actually test seconds. the phone, but that's what we found. We found some real faked papers. All right, and we go over to the mentor for question. Amazing job. That's just good presentation. And yeah, indeed, looks very much you found like you've, you've found more cases from this paper mill. So uh, yeah, if you're interested, I'd be happy to do some work on trying to systematically run that through the whole literature. We'd be and happy I'm to sure do Elizabeth you. Big would be uh, very happy to hear about it. She's been constantly frustrated by the people who get her data set to try to identify fake stuff and claim we can solve this with the machine learning and then come back delivering nothing. So yeah, great. But I guess going to different paper mills is going to be hard just based on that. So you would need to manually oh, sure. But I'm just curious to see first, how much more do we find from this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, we only did 8,000 and there's a lot more than 8,000 out there. Exactly. Mm. All right, guys, we move on to the next team. Uh, Bio Crocra, are you guys here? Yes, we are ready. Great, uh, feel free to begin. Uh, let me see. Uh, it was on the right screen. It, uh, can you see the presentation? I cannot. I can see the presentation in the browser, but I don't see a full screen. Oh, okay. What happens if you click present? Yeah, yeah. Thank Great. you. Uh, please get started. We are the team uh, BioCroco of probably uh, authentic uh, Chinese name for the team, and we are doing this co coding the web project. We are five guys from uh, North America and uh, Europe with different biology and uh, IT background. And we would be interested to know more about this modern web crawling techniques. Yeah, some background with the data we are doing. The molecular dynamic simulation data are the animation of film of this uh, protein structure prediction within nanosecond to milliseconds. So they also, always, so they will have uh, different parameters with or without most water molecule, the force field of the simulation, and with different algorithm, you get a different uh, input and output format. So it's very hard to normalize and compare them. And, and an individual researcher usually update those results to a general purpose repository. That means those uh, simulation files will sit next to a bloody tissue figures or some paper of an uh, unrelevant area. So it would be very nice for a researcher to have a nice looking, beautiful lookup table before they started doing a new simulation project. For example, for this COVID-19 related project simulation as the reference or the input data for the project. Yeah. So the methods we are going to use is a very modern pipeline from the Python to Jupyter Notebook to, create, to make it a reproducible to run by a user themselves. Uh, yes, we have the, and uh, for crawling the lab, the, the web, we have the beautiful soup and the web driver to 
automate the next page function and the more data analysis keyword selection of these results with Panda. And we also have some available data of what should the COVID-19 related protein look like. Yeah, so uh, from the crawling function, we will generate the CSV files, and then it will be a Jupyter notebook to do the keyword selection. Yes. Um, from this uh, crawling function, we can manage to get a CSV files with one record of these uh, COVID-19 related project sim simulation files. Yeah. And we spent some time to invest in the JavaScript function to do the same thing, but it was getting too complicated. Yeah, then we moved back to Python and managed to have a CSV output of the title, author, category, some keywords in the website. Yeah. Then we have the uh, Jupyter Notebook select, uh, keyword selection with pandas in Jupyter Notebook to make it more intuitive for the- One minute remaining. For the user, yes. Here we have one example of this uh, Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, here we can see the input files of the CSV file. We, we have the title, author, category, keywords, description in the website. So it's a two layer scrolling. Uh, from this title page to the individual page. And then in the end, we have this uh, one hit of the identified COVID-19 research. But we also have another, another analysis running with more features and hopefully we will get more results from it. Yes, so that's this. And what can we do next? And when we're checking the description, some of them have the Google Scholar or PubMed reference, then we can go to process the article with machine learning. And also uh, processing each record will take up to five minutes. So it'd be very Ten nice seconds. to use the big data methods and also investigate how compatible our scrolling package can be to other databases. Yes, thank you for your and attention. And now we go over to a mentor question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, really, really nice presentation. Like nice project um, progress you made in there that's very really cool and also that you identified in the paper which like totally gets lost in all the other publications in there so great for that uh, I was I was wondering what was like for you the most uh, challenging like also uh, you figured out a nice linking to the paper so were there any problems um, with that linking or where would you see further challenges to really um, define which are simulation data, which are not simulation data and related to each other? Uh, I think it was difficult to find some uh, good example of what should be a COVID related protein simulation website should be. Yeah, then okay. I think if we are doing other database, they, they have different data structure, then we need to, it would be like also chaining the selection keyword by ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. And now we move over to athletic regression. Are you guys ready? Yes, we're ready. Great. Please begin. Sharing the screen. Does everybody, everybody see? Okay. Good. Um, hi, we're Team Athletic Regression. We're three University of Copenhagen bioinformatics students and we did uh, some breast cancer classification into integrative clusters. So in the past, there has been a publication about uh, possible breast cancer clusters um, that can give more information of, uh, on the disease. And there have been multiple studies with different data sets. And uh, we focused on two specific data sets where the original one or, um, classified integrative clusters, um, whereas the other did not hold the integrative clusters data. So. What we had is uh, so the so-called Metabrick data set. This is the one with integrative, integrative clusters and the TCGA data set in order to then check if the classifier that we fit that can explain the, or that can make predictions on the integrative clusters is then applicable to the TCGA data set. Um, both data sets hold gene expression information, copy number variations, and metadata on patient data. And the original thought was to take gene expression data and patient metadata make a weighted voting classifier on both classifications and then make an um, educated uh, prediction on the integrative cluster. However, um, 
we have to consider for metadata information that those are very different depending on studies, depending on the data sets. Therefore, uh, we can only um, take the intersection of the patient data um, for MetaBrink and TCTA, which boiled down to four to five features that we would fit in um, classifier four, such that the um, score for the classifier was then around 15 to 20%, um, which was not good. So we dropped the classifier altogether. Um, what did yield more results is to find a um, classifier for gene expression data. And um, we start and then remove feature, uh, features in recursive fashion, which is done with RFE, and uh, boil it down from 25,000 genes to 1,000 um, important genes that give good information. We start out with um, random forests, and then um, we got around a 67 to 70% um, Accuracy on uh, we split this data into a uh, training and testing on a 75 to 25 split and then we, uh, on the test score we got around 65 percent with random forest and then a thousand um, genes that we um, boiled it down to. However, uh, we then pivoted to XGBoost because this gave us way better results and um, we fitted a final XGBoost uh, XG model on 1000 uh, genes to make integral cluster predictions. However, we then utilized the TCGA dataset and found that around 250 genes that were present from the MetaBrick dataset were not in the TCGA dataset. Therefore, we, we made a subselection, retrained the XG boost, and uh, made an integral cluster prediction um, on that data. So for the TCGA, we found integrative clusters. Um, however, just with the XG boost, we could only identify two clusters, which I'll come to in our One minute remaining. Thank you. Um, we then did, in order to validate the cluster that we found, uh, we looked at copy number vari variations fit on the recursive feature extraction random forest uh, classifier to give us also integrative clusters on the TCGA dataset just to have a comparison in between those. The copy number variations were much more promising, first off, so that was our final score that we got from the MetaBrick dataset. However, this did not transition to the TCAJ dataset because we could only classify two clusters and not all 10 clusters, which would mean um, that the gene expression data is wildly different between TCGA and MetaBrick, which would need for a normalization. We could do more z-score filtering in beforehand to filter out uh, the genes. And also, um, what I was getting into earlier is um, that the copy number variations are much more informative. So fitting classifiers on copy number variations gives way better um, insights into cluster fitting um, than just doing gene expression. That's what we found. And further insights and things that we would want to do is Ten do seconds. more grid search. Thank you. Do more grid search and uh, basically find better hyperparameters because we know XGBoost can do better than 80% on one data set. And then with a normalization, try to find more clusters across multiple data sets. That would be a research question to do. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Now we go over to the mentor for questions. I mean, do we have about 20 seconds or not, not more? Yes. Uh, about uh, 30. 40 seconds, go ahead. Okay, again, thank you very much guys because I didn't even realize how complicated this task is and now I see how really complicated it is. And just if someone does not understand, accuracy 67% here is accuracy, uh, which is only to say that initially it had 10 labels, not usual two labels that we are used to. So it's very high score for this task. And thank you very much that you really uh, did it to the mini to some meaningful conclusion. Uh, the question is, did you try to thank make uh, not pure expression, but the rank of them? Like you just filter out the genes that you wish to use, and after that, just use the rank of the expression inside each patient. Uh, yes, we also we also did um, a correlation of um, and filtered out for higher correlated genes and such, and then we also tested how is the gene correlation across the patients, and then how can we make um, cluster predictions from that. However, we found that um, doing a recursive feature extraction just on the forest data and on the boosting data, um, which so basically classifiers that give you feature importance per um, integrated feature, um, that um, already does a great deal. Um, um. I know where you're coming from. Um, we did not look into that um, because um, of the, uh, like we, we start with the correlation metrics, but do not go further down that road. But that would also be another approach to do it. Yes. Basically, pre selecting an intersection of. All the right, guys, wrap it up. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, 
And with that, we have one other team in the stack, Serratus Ultra Deep Coronavirus Homology Search. You guys uh, here? Um, we haven't been able to get in touch with those guys. If there's any other teams that uh, we haven't been able to get in touch, so we've uh, left <laughs> until now, has anybody not presented? Okay, and with that, it appears to me that we're uh, ready to wrap up our presentation session. Thank you to everybody that's been here and thank you for some wonderful presentations. Uh, this went much better than I expected for the amount of people and the content that we have. Um, and with that, we're going to break for voting and um, to just take a little break before the awards and debrief.